And I'm going to present just shortly, uh, briefly about Urban Harvest in case any of you who are joining this evening are new to Urban Harvest and our mission here in Houston. So uh, we have been gardening for good, as we like to say, since 1994. And Susie, have you been involved with Urban Harvest since the kind of beginning? Almost, yeah, almost. Yeah, um, so we have been working in communities um, all over Houston, building and starting community gardens, school gardens, our farmer's market, um, the first farmer's market in Houston, and um, doing all that great work since 1994. This is our mission. We cultivate thriving communities through gardening and access to healthy local food. Um, and you can see there our core values are integrity, empowerment, sustainability, and equity, working to ensure folks who are growing their own food and accessing healthy local food are able to do that with sustainability in mind so that community gardens are, have the resources to continue, that they can be there for five, 10, 15, 20 years. Some of the gardens in our network have been around that long. So really working to make sure folks have that ability to garden, grow food for their communities, for themselves, and nourish their you know, mind, body, spirit. Uh, if you haven't already visited our Urban Harvest Market on Buffalo Speedway, highly encourage you to go. It's every yeah. Saturday from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, there off of Buffalo Speed Speedway. It's the largest farmer's market in the region, over 90 vendors right now. Uh, you can find all kinds of vegetables, fruit. Uh, I think last weekend we had blueberries, which is very exciting. So uh, highly recommended that you check that out. Or one of our mobile farmer's markets. So we provide fresh, healthy food in communities that do not have access historically marginalized communities and that is a refrigerated van that we sell vegetables and fruits and products like honey and bread and eggs and meat from these vendors same vendors that work at our farmers market um, and we just bring it to them in a refrigerated van called our mobile farmers market uh, tonight you're joining us in one of our uh, classes so that we teach over 60 organic gardening classes every year and this includes basic courses to our permaculture series our growing organic vegetable certificate series and different awesome. workshops like fruit tree pruning so there's lots of opportunities to learn over the year with us um, we support over 140 gardens throughout the greater Houston area that spans from Houston uh, to Galveston to Magnolia so a large area all different kinds of diverse gardens throughout Houston. Um, and we also, of course, expose Houston youth to the wonders of gardening, of where their food comes from, of actually pulling out a carrot from the ground or picking a fresh tomato um, and exposing them to the wonders of the natural world like native plants, what you're gonna learn about today um, of kind of taking that transformation and, and planting more native plants. If you are interested in volunteering with us, we would love, love, love to have you. We're getting back in person, which is very exciting. So you can visit us and volunteer even at the farmer's market, at a dig it day, a school garden event with us, uh, usually there on the weekends on a Saturday morning. Um, if you're not already part of our monthly newsletter, please sign up. And if you use social media, you can find us on both Instagram and Facebook. And I think we're on you know, Twitter and LinkedIn and all those fun pages as well. Um, Susie Shapiro has been a member of the Community Gardens Committee for a number of years. She is highly involved in um, our community garden program with Mend at Mendel Park, Meredith Gardens. She is a um, gardener there and has been incredibly useful and, and helpful in that committee and expanding the reach of community gardens and um, has a lot to share about native plants. So I'm very excited to have you here, Susie, and thank you for your time. I'm so happy you invited me. All right, I'm Susie Shapiro, as we've discussed. And um, uh, before I go forward, I want you to see this picture in the front, those yellow cone flowers, that, those are uh, swamp sunflowers. And behind them is salt marsh mallow. And this is a marsh plant that is planted in the middle of what is basically a prairie in full sun, not in a marsh. It is also planted in the garden that's next to the house, which is a rain garden. And we'll, and we'll uh, see more of that in a minute. But one of the things that has really interested me, and you'll see this again, is how a plant that um, we read is supposed to grow in this condition or that condition can do pretty well in other conditions. 
it's just interesting. I have a beauty berry in blazing prairie sun, and it seems pretty happy. Go figure. All right. So now I am going to take us to the next slide. This is how, pretty much how it looked when we started, before we started tearing it up. There have already been some small trees uh, removed uh, from, from near the porch. And you can see in, the, in this area here, this, uh, is that jasmine? That was all the way across here. And my neighbors have already started, help, you know, we're sharing here. But you can see that it was really overgrown, number one, and you couldn't see the house. Two things really prompted this. One was the overall soil level on the property had gotten above in a pier and beam house. You've got the beam and then you've got the pier and it had gotten above the beam. So that really wasn't good for under, uh, under the house. So we needed to change the soil level and the foliage that you see next to the house is up on a little berm, a little uh, hill, about 12 to 18 inches above the soil level. And then the previous owner put the irrigation between the hill and the house. So you couldn't run the irrigation without having it run up under the house. So there were just a lot of issues. So. None of those, none, nothing in there was native. Um, and I have a very understanding and caring husband who thought it looked ugly too. So we just went for it. Boom, <laughs> it's all gone, right? We had bulldozers in the front yard and the whole thing. But as you can see, every bit of that was taken away. A lot of it was shared. A lot of it went to another home, and I just really do that as much as I can. I mean, why wouldn't I do that? Why wouldn't I share these plants rather than just put them in the landfill? So that made a lot of people happy, and a lot of it lives across the street from me still, so I get to visit it. Anyway, I said, look, if we're going to do this, we're just going to do it right. We're going to use permaculture principles. We're going to manage this water so that it goes into the beds uh, as much as possible, because I will admit I have a lot of hardscape on, on, in this landscape. I'm not getting any younger and I wanted to be able to walk safely and pull a cart for a long time. And I wanted also to create some, um, uniformity some uniformity and some structure to plain structure to balance the craziness that native plants can cause okay so to define the beds and all of that uh and on the this one on the left is the front yard that all of that soil was after it was scraped it was and before the walkway went down they solarized that with black plastic and those, those, uh, uh, what was it, mulch or whatever those, those bags were on the plastic in my yard for like two months. It was, I told people it was just the modern way to landscape. I have understanding neighbors. Anyway, and then the one, the, the one on the right, uh, on the far right corner, there's a seating area. You can't see it right now, but you'll see it later. Uh, and I have a lovely seating area. And then on the left side, that's the garage. At the back of the garage, I got a potting shed put in. That was one of those empty spaces that people tended to leave behind garages that just collected junk and leaves. Now I have a potting shed. And those big black things sitting there turned into a pond later on. So fast forward <laughs> by all, two years, right? I wanted to create something that had some aesthetic year round. I wasn't sure how I was going to look like that winter garden. It turns out I did. Um, and I wanted plants that were native to our area as much as possible. 
and uh, were fairly easy to manage. We have some success there and some things um, are a little more challenging. But the interesting thing, I think, the, the way the soil, I'll give you a quick review too. The way this soil was prepared, it was, it was sifted twice. No new soil came on the property, only compost. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was dug down a few inches. The artifacts, and uh, there were artifacts. Uh, I, I found china and silverware and a lot of um, oyster shells and things. So we cleaned that out in as many weeds as we could. We solarized it, we cleaned, they cleaned it again. Every bit of this soil has been through a man's hands twice and mixed with compost. And that made that, I don't think anybody could ever imagine how great that is. Anyway, um, let me see if I can move this. Yes, I can. I'm going to move me here. All right. So this is, one on the left is the driveway bed, and it, it defines this eastern edge. You see the pavers next to the driveway. We put those pavers in uh, on both sides all the way back. So we didn't have to step in the dirt to get out of the driveway or out of our car. And we've been pretty happy with that. So then we had this narrow bed. Uh, and then to the left of it, there's the gravel area that belongs to my neighbor and then his bed. So this bed um, next to the driveway is super interesting all year round. It changes all the time. And then it gets really rowdy and I have to keep it under control so I can get out of my car. Uh, the picture on the right is the back porch that we put in. The porch, original porch was really worn out and unsafe. So this um, comes on at night. It's on a timer and it comes on at night. And I felt like it was very important because for, of safety, for one thing, you step out side into a dark backyard and you can't see those steps. So safety, and then I just think it's really good looking. So I'm, I'm loving that. This was a big milestone in the garden. And that was that deep freeze uh, um, over Valentine's in 2021. And I'm thinking, oh, bad word, my garden is dead. It really wasn't. If you look closely, you can see there's a lot of green out there, which gave me some hope. But I, I thought, oh, it'll probably, I'll, the one on the right, okay, this freeze happened 1215. 311, this is just a few weeks later, the spider lily is blooming. And I'm thinking, things are going to be okay. This is a Texas spider lily. You see how the center of it is filled in as opposed to the, there's lots of varieties, but um, it kind of comes and goes when it feels like it. That's in the rain garden next to the house. And this one picture on the left is taken from the porch, similar to the one you saw without any vegetation. So you can still see the pathway, All right? So just before the freeze happened, on the left, you're going to see the flowers that were in my garden in February. Check it out. It was pretty wonderful. And then on the, the one on the, the right, it, April 7th, so that's less than two months later, the iris started blooming in the rain garden. And it was so exciting because that was the first time they had bloomed uh, in the rain garden and they put on quite a show. One thing I'll tell you, uh, this was the first year that I, the rain garden really performed in the way it was designed. I don't know what the next slide, yeah, there it is. Okay, so this is the rain garden at, just after it was put in in 2020, and this is how it looked this year. There, uh, what you're seeing, uh, those yellow flowers are the uh, a uh, giant uh, cone flower. And the same cone flower is out in the easement with no water, no irrigation, blazing sun, 
These next to the house in the summer are in part shade. So they are much taller. They're stretching a little more, but they're still holding up. They're not falling over. I'm very proud of them. Um, so anyway, this little garden, uh, you can see in two years has changed remarkably. So at first, like during the winter, by now the cherry, Cherokee sedge had grown, but there wasn't much else in there that was looking good, except the ferns in the back. And then, then came the, um, uh, in the inland sea oaks started coming and the penstemon came up and things that you can't see in the picture on the right because now the mallows and the hibiscus are gonna fill up that entire bed. Before you know it, those cone flowers are, I don't know how they're gonna behave this year. I didn't have them last year. They were in there, but they didn't show up. So we'll see, it'll be an interesting situation. But I think it, in two years, the, the change there and is remarkable. Here's another way of looking at the change. This was on the left, pretty you could see that the irrigation hose has, hasn't even been put away. But already, if you look back into the rain garden, this is a few months after the rain garden was put in, look how much it has grown. I, and it's got flowers and that I just think it was the whole thing was magic. All right, but anyway, what I wanted you to see was that down here, these are two of these little uh, fall obedient plants, two. That's all that was put in there. This, this is fall obedient plant in that bed now. And I can tell you that one of my, one of my um, aesthetics is I don't want these plants growing right up to the sidewalk because I don't want people who, we have a lot of people walking in this neighborhood and I don't want people to feel crowded uh, like they have, need a machete to walk by my house. So I wanna keep the plants back a little bit from, from the edge. Luckily for me, uh, I put, I advertised in the um, Native Plant Society newsletter that um, people could come to my garden and dig up my seedlings. Of course, under my supervision, make an appointment, we'll get together and I'll show you what I'd like to get rid of and you can dig it up and take it home. I've had over 30 people come to my house and dig up plants and many of them uh, went to schools, which really makes me happy. Uh, I've really been happy with that. Um, everybody's been very respectful and careful, trying not to take too much soil and making sure they got the right plants and so on. So it saved me a whole lot of work. I still have plenty. Um, I didn't run out, but it's been a real joy to have that happen. This is the is in the butter. The, this is the little garden that has the um, yellow Indian grass. You can't see that really in this view, but it is right here in the middle, back in here. Now that's almost all you can see. Um, and the oh, I'm sorry. This is not that dark. Just a minute. Let me back up. And this is not what I meant. That garden's over here. Rewind it. This is this garden. That was 2020. This is 2022. And here we're looking from the porch again. So there's those cone flowers. So that's what I look at when I walk out my front door. And it is always different. And it's always fun. The, the butterflies are beginning to show up and the bees are already there and busy. And um, I see so many interesting insects. It's just way fun. Here's another view of that same bed. This was 21, this is 22. It's just amazing. Look at this, this is those um, swamp sunflowers in 21. 
You remember how tall they were in the first picture? They are fall bloomers. Uh, and, the, and so that's part of it. This is April, spring, but still. It's, this garden now is, is all, uh, full. And oh, husband made the sign for that, remind the neighbors that this was not a bathroom for their pets. This is a view now in the backyard. I had a video and um, you're just gonna have to come and visit because I can't get the video figured out to play for you, but there's running water, there's a wind chime, there's insects flying around and big oak tree in the next yard. And it's really, really nice. Uh, this picture was taken um, back in that corner. There will eventually be some very tall ferns. They're not native, but they're pretty hardy. And um, then I've got uh, two winged silver bells and Carolina buckthorn back there. And, more spider lilies, so it's it's much native. This is a uh, pickerel weed here in the pond, and this is frog's eye view kind of thing looking from the back of the pond. So, some of the things I learned <laughs> was, you know, that you know that these plants move around. They did not end up as I showed you where I planted them. They moved around. This is a volunteer plant. I looked this plant up and it's actually got medicinal value. I didn't plant it. It just showed up. It's supposed to have medicinal value and become kind of shrubby. I'm pretty sure it's not going to get to live in my garden, but it's interesting for the moment. Um, and we've already talked about how many people came to my garden. This one uh, on the bottom, it's called Three Globe False Mallow. Who knew that, right? So one of the things to do if, is, um, if you're not familiar with iNaturalist, uh, it's fantastic for this because you just use that app and you take the picture and they have an amazing logarithm that they can very often figure out what you saw. Uh, it's, it's really fun and it, it helps a lot. That's how I got, I found out what that was. And then there's things that some people don't like in their yards and native plant people think it's okay. This is, as you walk it up to my front porch, there was this really ugly, water hose thing. Uh, I have this, I got this great hose. It's called G-Force. You know, I want to tell you something. I have pages of notes here. I'm not using any of them. I hope I'm telling you everything you need. Uh, anyway, um, this G-Force hose is uh, more of a fabric. It's not like a rubber hose. So it's number one, it's lighter. Number two, you can coil it up in a smaller space. So it fits in that pot. So I, I put that in there and then uh, the horse herb showed up to fill up the rest of it. And I very much appreciated that. My husband also made, well, a friend of mine made the slippery when wet sign, but my husband decorated it with the little skeletons, missing legs and things. <laughs> so anyways, this is this uh, horse herb is something that shows up everywhere. You should never have to buy horse herb if you want it in your yard. And I've used it extensively for ground cover uh, because it, it's almost evergreen. It has little little, little yellow flowers that the, that the butterflies like. Um, it's easy to manage. Um, and you can actually walk on it a bit. It's, I wouldn't say it's not like turf grass, but it doesn't mind. So it's a, it's a pretty useful, it's a pretty useful tool. And it's, and it's fairly, it's fairly native to our region, not our Texas region, but I mean, as part of the United States region. 
And on the right is, is something called a Philadelphia flea bane that I, you probably saw popping up everywhere in the spring. It's actually gone now, but I bet it'll be back next spring. And it was an early flower for the bees. Uh, and another thing about the horse herb is early flowers for the bees. So, and in that same bed, there was the clover with beautiful pink flowers. It was really pretty. I used to spend a lot of time pulling out clover. And now I think it's beautiful because it'll come up in this little bed and it have those beautiful flowers and then it'll go away. What, what's not to like? So I've begun to really appreciate these things that are seasonal or ephemeral that come and go with the season and come back next year to be a surprise again. Oh, we're just about to the end of this formal presentation. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's next. This is narrow leaf milkweed, seed head. And I thought it was beautiful. Um, so there you can enjoy it too. Um, right now, some of the things that I'm busy with, I'm still, uh, I've got my, my door open for people who want to come and dig some plants. Um, and so that can always be arranged. I'm organizing urban, uh, native urban garden tours for spring, and probably they're going to take off in fall. Uh, we're kind of just getting the ball rolling on those, but we are looking for people who have uh, gardens that are 50% uh, or more native plants and would be willing to have a tour group stop by and see them and would be willing to talk to us about it and um, you know, just tell a little bit of the story and walk around and answer questions. Uh, Wildscape Workshop, Native Plant Society is coming up in 2023. They always have amazing speakers. They have a big native plant sale. Um, and I think it's gonna be in person this year. Um, another thing that's coming up is I wanna learn more about native plants. Uh, um, Megan mentioned that I garden over in Mandel Park. That is on the corner of Richmond and Mandel. Uh, and it's a beautiful park. It's probably something you've driven by if you live in the neighborhood, but just never bothered to stop. I hope someday you will, because first of all, it's, it's a beautiful community garden. It was architect designed and um, and so it's, it's got a nice, nice look to it. And it's that part is really pretty. And then there's a park all around it. And part of the park is, is there's uh, bio swales around on two sides of the park, three sides of the park. Uh, and what, that, what a bio swale is, is basically a big ditch where water can, in, a, in an extreme weather can, situation, water can run off and fill it up and it does have drainage into the city water, but before it drains there, it's gonna go through a lot of plant material and get cleaner and um, not be as, as much of a burden on, on the city water supply. Um, another thing I'm interested in doing is, is continuing to work and get figure out how we can get more native plants available to more people. They're hard to find. Um, and we wanna change that. Uh, I was recently at EarthX, which is fabulous, uh, a fabulous um, convention or, I don't know the right word for it, but it's huge. This thing was so big, it filled up Fair Park in Dallas. Fair, Fair Park in Dallas, is an Art Deco, it's an old park, fair park, and they used to have the Texas State Fair there. So there's all these buildings and land around it. They filled this up with this conference. It's a huge thing. So keep your eyes open in the next spring for Earth X. Uh, I wanna convince more people to put native plants in their gardens and in their pots or whatever. And that's part of the reason for the urban plant tours so that people that are newer can see how other people have done it and people that are 
starting their gardens or a garden forever. I well, still want to see how other people have done it. And it's fun to meet other people that have done it. So uh, that's, that's just kind of what I'm up to now as far as my future plans. Uh, Native Plant Society monthly meetings, Master Texas Master Naturalist, Audubon Society are places you can learn about native plants. These are two um, vendors that uh, Morningstar Prairie Plants brings, has a booth at Urban Harvest uh, Saturday uh, Market, okay? And they bring plants and also you can contact them uh, and uh, go prepay, pre-order plants and they'll bring them to the market for you. He's out in Damon, Texas, which is out down the street from Brazos Bend. So if you live in that area, you could also just go there. But if you don't live there, you could have it brought to you. Um, I'm in Green Star Wetland Plants. That's where all my wetland plants came from. And she has, she's such a hard worker and she's now really expanded her property. She can, she can be the vendor for wetland plants for municipalities. On, she's really scaled up and she's a fabulous person. And so there's that too. You can go on her website. Uh, other places to get information. Jenna mentioned I Naturalist, Lady Bird Johnson. Uh, Doug Tallamy has uh, a lot of videos online talking about his vision uh, that something like 90% of the property in the United States is privately owned, either by individuals or corporations. If we could convince more people to plant native plants, well, then how much, how much better that could be? I mean, that just has all kinds of possibilities. Um, Another thing that's interesting, if you live in an area where you say, oh, my HOA would never let me do this, there is a natural area permit that Houston Parks and Recreation Department will grant you if you meet their criteria and you can go online and find out what that is. If you have a natural area permit, then, then you're gonna have a lot better chance of getting your HOA. Uh, to go along. Uh, one, one other thing about that is that I think one thing that makes my garden so acceptable, we sit, we sit on our front porch a lot and very, very often people walk by and thank me, you know, thank, thank us for the garden and tell us how much they like it or come up and talk to us about it. And it really makes me feel good when that happens. And so uh, also on Facebook, there are special interest groups um, that focus on native plants or food gardening, fruit growers in Houston. And those are really valuable. Uh, I had a problem with some tomatoes and I put it on the, the food growers and they told me right away what it was. And I'm like, me, okay. <laughs> so those things are really valuable. Um, and then, this is this picture here is the the um, frog fruit, which is the other ground cover, one of the other ground covers that I use extensively. Uh, and these little flowers, these little flowers here are really adorable all summer long. During the winter, after the freeze, this frog fruit all turned silver, as white as that that little skipper. And I was like, oh my goodness, I hope it'll come back. And sure enough, uh, when spring came and I went out to start working on things, I just kind of gave it a massage and knocked off the silver part. And within two weeks, it was green. These gardens really are fantastic. So mainly, that is what I have to say. And now I would be very happy to open up to questions. We can go backwards to different slides that you might have a question about, but I was just going to go through the, these slides uh, slowly while we talked. So 
Um, Oh, that's great, Susie. So I think what you're saying also is you have several slides of different um, native plants that are in your backyard to show as examples. Is that correct? Yes, yes. So this one on the left is two winged silver bells. It, it is so entertaining. Uh, it doesn't last long. Those little flowers. I mean, I, I think it's a good, good. It's a good excuse to have some people come over to your garden and visit. Come see the two winged <laughs> silver bells. They are so cool. <laughs> Because they're only going to last a week or two. Have a glass of wine and enjoy the silver bells. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you have, I mean, uh, if you want to click through those, we do have a few questions. And if folks have other questions, please put them in the chat. I can um, ask the two that I see in the chat. And then if you want to click through those so folks can see different varieties, that's great too. Um, I'll, I'll, out, I'll always uh, point out this little opposite leaf spot flower. This is the other ground cover that I, that I use. This is in that driveway garden. And mm. it takes full sun. It has these little yellow flowers all summer long. Um, it, it's, it just, and I, and to get it to, I just started out with a few very dead looking things left over from a native plant society plant swap and uh, stuck them in the ground and remembered to water them for maybe two weeks. <laughs> There they are. And so with that success, I just figured, well, when, uh, when I prune them to keep them off, off the driveway, I just build, you know, just dig another hole with my fingers, stick them in and put some water in and there they go. And they're almost all the way down my driveway now from these two little straggly things I picked up. It's just, they're, they're amazing. This is another view of the, of the backyard and there's the there's the pond how about that guy another pond view and we at the the if you can imagine from here trickling water wind chimes a slow panning of the whole backyard you'll just have to come and visit this is in the front rain garden. These, uh, these woolly mallows were insect heaven. Their, their seed, first of all, you see a bee going in for a landing right there. And then these are the, these are the seed pods that uh, after the, the, these are coming out, that after the flower fades, there's a seed pod. And it's got, it's all brown and woolly. It's pretty good looking in it's a, of itself. And it attracted this very interesting bug that you're going to see in a minute. It's a, a little bit like a lady beetle, but not really. I looked up the name of it, but it's so hard to pronounce. Anyway, uh, these are, this is in the rain gardens. So these are those little uh, penstemons. There's the edge of that cone flower. This is the inland sea oats. And this is the pink. I have the salt marshmallow in pink and in white. They're very, especially bees, love these. But interestingly enough, butterflies uh, have been interested and in, wasps have been interested in the, in the cone flowers. I'm guessing, uh, they're getting the fiber for their nest. Okay, so on the left, there is this little bug that I found in the woolly mallow seed head. Look how adorable they are. They're not quite that cute when they grow up, but um, this is it. And this is just a, a, you know, a honeybee on Seaside Goldenrod, that was a magnet, magnet for bees. They were just constantly on it. These little bugs, I cannot tell you. I've got stories to tell you about these bugs that are just, you won't even believe what happened. There was one of them on the edge of a leaf, and then there was an adult, which I'm gonna call mom, and then there was a whole bunch of the other juveniles on the other end of the leaf. And they were all milling around going, you know, where's mom? And why didn't she tell us what to do? I don't know what to do. Do you know what to do? They were all like that. Mom was over here. There was one 
juvenile on the edge of the leaf that wasn't moving. I don't know how long she'd been there before I walked up, but I was there close to a minute. And I guess in bug time, that's a long time uh, before. Oh, and at one point, the, the, these, bug, these bu other ones over here that were running around driving her crazy, I saw her just kind of go, kind of make a little flick. They all lined up and they went right down that, that stem, one right after another. They listened to their mother. And then at that point, she had to leave the one that wasn't moving. But I thought that was remarkable to watch. I just couldn't believe the that she would stay with that one so long. Anyway. Hey, Susie, we do have a couple of questions. I want to just pause here so we have enough time to answer. Sure. Um, so can you clarify? Um, Elaine said that she read something recently that horse herb isn't native. Oops, sorry, I scrolled up too fast. That isn't native and is considered invasive. Can you clarify? She has it in her yard and loves it and previously thought it was native. It is, um, look, a lot of, you know, first of all, you have to decide what native means to you. If we're talking about Harris County or the Gulf Coast region, we're going to be extremely limited. And I will say that a lot of what is in my yard is not that specific. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the horse herb is, um, I, I made a note about where, um, I thought I made a note about where that actually comes. But if you go to the, if you go to the uh, Ladybird Johnson wildlife uh, website and you look up horse herb, or go online and look up horse herb and look for you know its regionality, then you'll know. It's kind of like Gulf Coast region, this Eastern part of the United States. It's not like it didn't come from China. And so um, most of what I have is, some of what I have is more native, a little closer to home. Uh, and then a lot of it is, neighboring states and then some of it is eastern seaboard or eastern states one of my one of my uh, goals now is to increase the amount of really more local natives um i would really like that we you couldn't find everything we wanted when we when we put the garden in so some of these were considered placeholders but no, I don't have a hesitation about um, about uh, frog food. It's it's very uh, it's a it's very good host plant for skippers. It performs well in the garden. I've never I've never worried about it being. It's never been invasive. Now I've heard other people in other situations say, Ah, oh, that horse herb just went everywhere on me. So I think it depends on where you put it. Mostly, were, and by the way, I forgot to tell you all this. Another remarkable thing about this garden is, all right, we had uh, um, the, the drip irrigation, the, you know, the hose under the ground uh, for about eight months in this garden. And then it went haywire and it didn't work anymore. So there's no been no irrigation in this garden for a year and a half it just gets a buy on its own and so uh, one thing that may keep my horse uh, uh, frog fruit in line is the fact that it doesn't have a lot of water if it was in an area that was more wet or different conditions it might be a little more aggressive it's so one thing you learn about these plants they behave differently when you put them in a different place I hope that answers your question. Yes, um, I think that it did hopefully. Um, and it's along her driveway, which not much else thrives. It gets a lot of foot traffic and it still does great. Um, yeah. Good. Yeah. All right, question, a question from Sally about, can you elaborate, can you tell us more about the ponds in your backyard? Yes, I can. Um, well, the, the ponds 
didn't exactly turn out the way I envisioned, but uh, but they're just wonderful because of the the noise they make, and because they of uh, the difference in the vegetation, and also because uh, and now I have frogs every night. And I'm very happy about that that they serenade us and uh dragonflies of course i have them in the front and the back but you know they like the pond as well um it we had a we had a uh, issue with one of the hoses we couldn't figure it out for a long time but now we figured it out everything is set it's really not much trouble at all and it's uh the trouble is that is that the gallardia that was planted around the pond has become very happy there and now I've got to hack it down and figure out what to do there so you can see the pond and get to the pond. It has taken over. It's, it's just funny how things work. I mean, they were teeny little plants and I didn't plant the ones that are next to the pond in the hardscape that's around the pond. They planted themselves and they're about to fall in, I mean, they're in the pond. So. Things are always interesting when, when you're dealing with native plants. They decide where they want to go, and then you decide if you're going to let them. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. If you have any more questions, come and see me. You don't live far. Wonderful. Are there other questions from folks who would like to use the chat or unmute yourself and ask a question? Otherwise, it seems like you do have more photos to show. <laughs> oh. This is clustered bushman. It's pretty, pretty fun. It's this, this little feisty thing. And this is this big fat boy here is a carpenter bee. This, I think you can see that this is a fritillary on the Leatris Pycnostasia, the blazing star. They loved that. They really loved it. A little pin stimmon in the honeybee. This is the, the statue you saw before. I love that picture. The statue was got a um, was from a friend's family, and it was all in her family. And then she, she didn't have a place for it. And she didn't know what she was going to do with it. Of course, I'm fostering it. I'm her foster mother for now. If she ever moves to a place where she can have it, she'll have it back. But I love her. <laughs> um, question, Susie from Naomi: Do you have any edibles in your garden? Edible plant? I do. Uh, I've got I've got a, a dwarf Meyer lemon. I have a, a small herb garden because you know I garden a block away, so um, I don't I'm I'm weaning myself off of growing food in my backyard. It's hard, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm getting better. But I do have a dwarf Meyer lemon and uh, herbs and things like parsley and cilantro and dill and oh I've got this um oh, it's thyme it's lemon thyme I got it at Buchanan's if you ever see it there rub your hand on it it is delightful because thyme usually is for me something kind of harsh or strong this lemon thyme is so delicious you know, thyme comes on that kind of a or stick so you can just kind of strip it off of there and those little bitty leaves will come off. I've put it on fruit salad. I've put it on steamed vegetables. I've mixed it in with uh, some kind of a salad. It is delicious. So that, that was a find. This little fiery skipper is probably there because of some of the plants, host, you know, plants in the yard that are hosting it. It's super easy. Look at these little aerodynamic wings, the way they fold up. And this is a fritillary on, uh, uh, this is a spotted bee, spotted bee balm. And this, this little plant right here, you see how it's got those little balls on it? Well, they stay on there all winter. The petals will fall off, but these little black balls are like, strong string of pearls sort of and they stayed there all winter and I thought they were sort of architectural and interesting in an otherwise kind of not so interesting garden and so I appreciated them all winter long 
And that's me. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Susie. Folks are saying thank you. Really enjoyed your presentation and your garden and um, yeah, learned a lot. There are a couple of resources. I know that um, you say that some of the plants listed on Nine Natives maybe aren't are questionable, but I did put in the chat the Nine Natives booklet and the Nine Natives for shade, but you gave some great yes. examples there. And also you named Buchanan. So there's a number of uh, local nurseries and garden stores where you can find native plants and also, also Joshua's also Joshua's is up there in the right. heights and see yes. my idea for getting a local plant plant grower is to convince those people to stock actual native plants that are grown in our area and are mm -hmm. more appropriate for our area than what they currently stock in Colorado. right I haven't watered this garden in a year and a half you're not going to have to fertilize it. You're going to have to maintain it if you keep any kind of garden. You know, you want to keep it tidy. It's, uh, everybody's got their own aesthetic. But it's so much fun. Because mm -hmm. when, when you're in this garden, you, keep, you see cool stuff that you wouldn't see if you were in the house or in a garden where all the plants came from another country and no right. bugs visited. No lawn to mow either. No lawn to mow. Mm -mm. <laughs> Great. 